I think we're going to get going. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New York Southeast Asian Networks event uh, that I'm very pleased to be moderating. I'm Margaret Scott. I'm with the New York Southeast Asian Network in New York University. And I want to welcome everyone at various, from various parts of the world and time zones. I encourage anyone who's new to the New York Southeast Asia Network to go to our website, New York Southeast Asia Network, nysean.org, and uh, become a member, sign up for our weekly newsletter. If you're interested in Southeast Asia, it, it is a really wonderful hub and resource. Um, and there's lots of interesting people that come through. And today we have two very interesting people that we're very welcome, uh, delighted to welcome. Uh, first, I want to thank the New York Southeast Asia Network for sponsoring this and to our wonderful coordinator, Srinath Poole, for putting this together. Uh, we are here to talk about a wonderful new book that Meredith Weiss has recently published by Cornell University Press and NUS in Singapore. Uh, it's The Roots of Resilience, Party Machines and Grassroots Politics in Southeast Asia. And Meredith, as many of you know, is one of the leading specialist scholars and commentators on all things Malaysia and Singapore. And she does many other things as well. And she's been part of a wonderful long, uh, many multi-year research project, which I'll get to in a minute. But her day job is she's a professor and was head of the political science department at the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs at uh, the Uni University of Albany, part of the State University of, uh, System in New York. Um, and she's written a lot, and this is her latest, but it will soon be accompanied in July by yet another book that's gonna be published by Cambridge University Press entitled Mobilizing for Elections, Patronage and Political Machines in Southeast Asia. And I've already um, asked Meredith and perhaps, perhaps Professor Wally to come back and talk about that book when it's out. But for today, we will be talking about the roots of resilience. And uh, the conversation will be conducted with Professor Wali Jumblat Abdullah, which I'm sure many of you who are on this call know for many reasons. Uh, he's an assistant professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore at the Public Policy and Global Affairs Department. Uh, he is a specialist on um, Islam and the state and Islamic politics. And he has a 2021 book out Islam in a Secular State, Muslim, Muslim Activism in Singapore. And many people probably know him more for his podcast, Ted Tarek with Walid. Uh, and I've been dabbling in it and it's really interesting and I'm delighted that you could join us today. And without further ado, I'd like to turn, oh, first I have a couple of uh, uh, comments. Uh, besides talking about upcoming events, what I wanna do is uh, focus on today. Meredith is going to talk a little bit, give us an overview of her book, and then Walid and Meredith will have a conversation, and then we're going to be opening it up to questions. The chat uh, is not on for today, but the Q&A and raise hand options are. You can either type your question into the Q&A, and I'll be taking a look at that, or you can raise your hand. We're going to devote uh, the last part of it to a conversation with our audience. So just remember either the Q&A or the raise hand when we get to that. So Meredith, over to you, thank you. Hey, thanks, um, I will share my screen. So um, thanks Margaret and of course, thanks Walid and thanks to all of you for coming and to me for organizing everything. So I will start with just a brief overview of the book. Um, I, I'll be a pretty good off chance that not everyone here has had a chance to read it. Um, the book aims to explore what sustains electoral authoritarian regimes by examining political institutions and patterns in Singapore and Malaysia from the late colonial era to the present. And it's worth noting that what pushed me to dive into this research and write the book was a growing sense from other research that I had done and other things I had observed that we give too little attention to the actual workings of politics, including what politicians actually do. Many of you may be familiar with the sort of analysis that Chan Heng Chi offered decades back for Singapore. Her book was an especial um, inspiration for this one. I wanted to get a better sense of how the various faces of the polity, formal and informal, structural and cultural fit together. So I'll give just a very broad outline to leave plenty of time for the discussion and Q&A, um, but do feel free to ask basic clarification questions. 
And again, I do not expect that you've read the book, so I won't be insulted if you haven't. So I'll lay out the political science -y background first. So electoral authoritarian regimes are our core topic here. And these are regimes in which elections are meaningful, but they're less than free and fair. So it's hard to change the government that way. They blend democratic and authoritarian attributes, but these governments don't want to have to rely too heavily on coercion to govern. They prefer legitimacy, but not necessarily in terms of democratic legitimacy from popular sovereignty. Uh, sorry, political scientists tend to speak of democratic transitions and consolidation overwhelmingly in terms of elections and changes in top leaders. So there was a lot of buzz about it, democratizing election in Malaysia in 2018, for instance, even if they might muse about, for instance, whether democratic norms should lead or follow that change. Instead of starting from that institutional perspective, I change our understanding of a regime in this book to building on the work of others to question how citizens experience regimes, to understand why they keep voting for them, since these regimes in Singapore and Malaysia, for instance, do enjoy and have enjoyed real support, and also what it would take for these systems and how they work to change. And again, among the most obvious applications for such a perspective is the fact that Malaysia's government did change fleetingly in 2018 before rapidly regressing to essentially a messier version of the mean prior to that point. Much of my analysis centers also on clientelism, which I consider through three perspectives. The first is individual level patron client ties. That's what many understand as clientelism. The second is a policy framework that focuses on particularistic or discretionary rather than programmatic policies. So that means making benefits contingent on support or giving the impression that they are. And the third is me mechanisms or structures for mobilization, especially in terms of political machines. There are three primary arguments or levels to my analysis. The first is that parties structure politics. So up until around the time of separation of Singapore from Malaysia, both states' political future and institutional or partisan order was uncertain. There were viable alternatives. Fairly soon after that point, the PAP and the Alliance, which became the BN in Malaysia, secured preeminence, entrenching a particular style of politics and an economic model in the process. Over the course of decades, these parties then designed or altered institutions, established policies, especially relevant were economic structures and welfare policies, and cultivated norms conducive to their staying in power. So parties and the rules under which they operate sit at the structural core of electoral authoritarian regimes. Among other strategies, these parties define their ideas and approaches to minimize the scope for ideological challenges. For instance, the BN's expansion of race-based affirmative action in the 1970s gave the Malay majority added incentives to prefer communal politics. These dominant parties present themselves as the people's champions and core providers, even when what they are delivering are actually state resources that are simply made to appear to come from a party rather than from the state. Second, I stress that local government offers a key prop to electoral authoritarianism, both for maintaining the party in power and in shaping citizens' expectations of officials. Even if most power and resources rest at the center, as they do in both these states, it's at the local level that party machines play a direct governance role as parties render themselves visible and useful. And that includes parties as challengers who seek to establish a reputation and base. Singapore and Malaysia both started with local, not federal elections or national elections. Then they phased them out fairly early on. So levels of government became structurally fused, the local with the state in Malaysia and the local with the national in Singapore. That centralization and amalgamation of tiers of government shapes both how citizens encounter the state and the arenas in which political parties operate. The incapacity that debilitated local councils offered an opening for political parties, especially initially in Malaysia. So bureaucratic weakness at the local level proved essential to sustaining partisan machines and depoliticizing, making just managerial core aspects of governance. The choice of now nominated rather than elected local councillors in Malaysia came to prioritize party loyalty over specific skills and local councillors are accountable to the party, not to the public. In Singapore, the centralization of elected government happened even as the state extended its reach. Citizens became deeply reliant upon state services, such as public housing, 
and social assistance programs as these exponentially expanded, which pressed Singapore to reintroduce municipal authorities in the 1980s, but now headed by MPs completing that centralization. Opposition parties in both states have, helped, have felt pressed to build their own competing machinery for local service delivery. And third, I look at personal linkages, which are individual level mecha mechanisms of clientelism in the sense of sustained and responsive, but hierarchical, mutually beneficial relationships as an especially durable underpinning of electoral authoritarian politics. These ties are personalized. Voters know their MPs and expect to see them at neighborhood festivals or knocking on doors. Where permitted, which is a key distinction between Malaysia and Singapore, it's at this level that politicians may especially capitalize also on links with civil society. Clientelist linkages are especially important where endemic dominance by a catch-all party diminishes the space for substantive differentiation as politicians need some way other than programmatic appeals to make themselves stand out to voters. And a personal vote may tip the balance even where party loyalty and party vo voting are strong. What offers resource strapped challengers a lifeline is that these connections are not just about dispensing patronage, but also about physical visibility and personal empathetic interaction to build connection and trust. That is the personal touch. And those personal ties allow a form of direct accountability beyond elections. So in a nutshell, I find that decades worth of experience of PAP or BN governance has shaped how citizens relate to their state and what they expect of lawmakers. I term this authoritarian acculturation or the process by which citizens become acclimated over time to a particular mode of politics. That process happens not in the abstract via a remote tier of national leaders, but actively on the ground. So it's politicians micromanagement, of small visible concerns that ensures that voters know and appreciate their public officials and feel personally well served by the system in place, never mind its overall timbre or shape. So, um, oops, sorry, again. Um, so although less than fair elections, curbed civil liberties and targeted coercion do help to sustain those regimes, selectively structured state policies and patronage, partisan machines that effectively stand in for local governments, and diligently sustained clientelist relations between politicians and constituents are at least as important. That system entrenches a particular style of contestation and outreach, even among challengers. These relational and instrumental ties, rather than ideology or programmatic plans, matter a lot, even if not equally among citizens. And opposition politicians thus feel pressed to replicate the dominant party's approach, supplying their own individual and group level services, support, and simple presence. There are important similarities between these two states, but the quality of electoral competition and links with civil society especially render Singapore's authoritarian acculturation stronger than Malaysia's, and that's a critical factor in the greater resilience of its regime than Malaysia's. Just a very quick note on my methods. I conducted scores of interviews with politicians and activists. I visited service centers, campaign rallies, constituency events, meet the people sessions. I draw a lot on archival materials, both print and uh, Singapore's oral history archive in particular. Um, contemporaneous as well as contemporary, academic, political party, media, and other accounts. Um, just a, a range of different qualitative and interpretive sources and approaches. I aim for a thickly contextualized historical institutional approach in which homing in across dimensions from parties and policies at the national level to local governance to individual level linkages between politicians and constituents allows me to consider how politics actually happens beyond elections and the expectations and habits that Praxis instills among challenger parties and voters. And I will say that I did also, I was able to commission a survey to try to get at voters' attitudes. That matters for the, the account, but it's really, I draw much more on other sources. Three important caveats. First, the dominant party's share of the popular vote in both these states has been declining overall to the extent that the BM lost in 2018. The part of the story on which I focus here is only part of the story. Many voters do vote on programmatic grounds or they favor normative premises for political legitimacy rather than instrumental ones. But having experienced only one model of politics since independence, most voters have been acculturated toward this mode of governance and standard for accountability. 
And not only may the marginal difference between a strong and weak personal vote make the difference in increasingly tight contests, meaning candidates from no party can afford to ignore that really exhausting labor of working the ground, but also transforming the regime requires more than changing its top leadership. Second, these positions are not fixed forever. These regimes are resilient, but they are not impervious to upset. The political machine could fail as from an economic downturn or gross mismanagement. There may be changes in voters' preferences and expectations. So urbanization, for instance, increases interest in reliable, programmatic rather than discretionary public services, while also disrupting ties with known patrons from back home. There can be ideological shifts, as with an increasing preference for political Islam in Malaysia. There can be emergence or amplification of a political cleavage that differentiates parties. We don't see that so much yet in Malaysia or Singapore, but Taiwan is a good example of that. Or there could be the death or disgrace of a leader that creates an opening, though opposition parties may not yet have the plans or proactive support at that moment to be able to take full advantage. And third, the system is not all bad. It entails a form of responsiveness and it's mutually beneficial and voluntary. Voters are not mere pawns either. Moreover, the social welfare implications of clientelist patterns should be compared not just against those of programmatic systems, but also against more predatory ones. So clientelism centers around and facilitates divvying up and distributing national public goods, even if with suboptimal efficiency. Now, I won't give the full story for either state, but I'll end by mentioning just a few of the attributes or angles on which I focus. This is less to illuminate than just to steer your thinking and prompt questions. So first, Malaysia. Municipal elections came first, then state elections, then federal elections through the 1950s under majoritarian or first past the post rules that the parties contesting helped to design in Malaysia. The United Malays National Organization or UMNO came to power with British support from the start as an ethnic based mass membership parties party with connections to society across classes. And as of 1952, so really early on, right at the outset, at British urging and for financial reasons, it allied first with the Malaysian Chinese Association or MCA, then also with the Malaysian Indian Congress or MIC as the alliance, which later uh, developed into the BN, the Barisan Nacional or National Front. Opposition parties have contested consistently in Malaysia and have consistently won subnational governments, initially at the municipal level, along with the state level. Some of these parties protect group interests, they're communal, some are ideologically, ideological and have accordingly programmatic policies. Some have been a vehicle for a particular faction or leader, and none of these parties has ever been fully internally unified or coherent, not surprisingly. Political parties in Malaysia have all along been connected with and or rooted in civil society organizations. Those links are still important, even if block voting is rarer now than it used to be. A partisan political economy developed early on. UMNO was initially penurious. They relied on members pawn jewelry, lotteries, fund fairs, and so forth, as well as being desperate for dues paying members, including from you know, fairly radical left-wing groups at the outset. But lax campaign spending laws, plus forays into business starting early, really with UMNO's takeover of, of the newspaper Uchisan in 1961, quickly increased the space for money politics. The Alliance and then BN, restructured the economy for development generally and for the specific benefit of their supporters, especially from UMNO, uh, with things like land and agricultural inputs, access to um, small enterprise capital and so forth. Those efforts became more aggressive and interventionist and openly partisan over time, especially as all BN parties expanded their corporate holdings and their financial clout. Party office itself then also became a route to riches. The BN government also used fiscal centralization, which is stark in Malaysia, to starve opposition held state governments of resources right from the start. So beginning with 1959, the what's now we call POS, but the pan Malayan Islamic parties win in Kelantan and Terengganu. The same was, was true of local governments. Essentially the government, the federal government and really the British initially set them up to fail then got rid of them amid allegations of poor performance. Doing so denied a key niche for opposition parties and allowed the state level party to substitute its machinery via appointed local councillors. Until today, also at the federal as well as state level in most parts of Malaysia, though this is changing, opposition constituencies are denied equal constituency development funds through their elected legislators. 
Um, and then also we have a bloat in the civil service, especially post 1970 with the, the NEP, the national, the new economic policy that serves a similar purpose to the patronage jobs we see in other countries. So all told, we have a massive growth in public sector and federal economic involvement amid rent seeking, corruption, and a lack of transparency or accountability. Meanwhile, parties actively court group loyalties, including often with payments or preference. So those are farmers and fishers, hawkers, Chinese educationists, festival committees, mosques and temples, and more. There is definitely less individual vote buying in most of Malaysia than elsewhere in Southeast Asia, but we do see collective or club goods, uh, as well as things like treating voters to food and entertainment and just generally splashing out at elections. There's also assiduous credit claiming, like distributing welfare payments at party offices. Since the abrogation of local elections starting in the mid 1960s, there have been intertwined levels of government and the state legislator really picks up the slack for sometimes subpar local councillors. Service centers serve as an important node in that, that system. So this is where we have ground level pr provision of municipal services. And those efforts may matter more to voters than less tangible national policies. It's also here that parties may distribute federal or state welfare payments to claim credit. All these practices, left the BN reliant on continued access to patronage resources, but also pressed challengers to respond in kind. So development promises, partisanized programs, and patronage-based appeals are now systemic rather than BN specific, discouraging too emphatic or consistent a focus on ideology or issues. Also, the expectation of hands-on service is the core of politicking. That requires a pool of members, a huge investment of time and money, and it encourages citizens to rely on the politician as patron and a party machine and to develop a hyper-local view of the state. So just one statistic that demonstrates that, over 95% of those we surveyed in Malaysia say that what they value most in federal and state legislators is community service and securing, securing local development projects. Nearly zero say it's a policy record that matters. And opposition parties replicate that however inefficiently and harder that is without resources. Turning to Singapore, as in Malaya, self-government and elections began at the local level, but the PAP dissolved both the city council and the rural board, which was 80% of Singapore at the time, shortly after gaining control of the legislative assembly in 1959. The launch of town councils in the 1980s partly resuscitated local government. Initially, aggressive vote buying, intimidation, and general malfeasance marred polls through the 1950s in Singapore, justifying what has been enduring strict regulation of campaign practices, as well as compulsory voting as of 1959 for both local and national elections. The PAP, which came to power as an ideologically left-wing programmatic party, despite rather than because rather than through the benefit of the British, and suffered early rifts is a cadre party with tight top-down control over recruitment, minimal internal pluralism, strong central direction, and corporatist ostensibly non-ethnic ties to the voting public. That cadre structure became the norm in Singapore. The PAP's major threat once it had gained power was from a splinter party, Barisan Socialists, which it quashed coercively in the early 1960s rather than through election. But that the PAP, unlike UMNO and the Alliance, had to claw its way up fundamentally shaped the party and its approach to governance and helps explain its deep aversion to challenge, however much it encourages citizens to participate through safe channels and its resistance to alliances between parties and civil society, including independent unions, as well as its own tightly closed structure. The PAP itself though has always relied heavily on partners, especially trade unions from the outset and the People's Association or PA grassroots network since 1960. The PAP inherited a state with severe shortages of housing, employment, and social services, and it built its position in providing those. That carved out a strong role for the state in the economy, incorporating levers for social control in that process and making it harder for the opposition to succeed once it finally got to office. Housing, pensions, and so forth make nearly all Singaporeans, both clients of and stakeholders in a PAP-led state with warnings consistently that another party might not manage so well. From the start, the PAP, like UMNO and like the BN parties, built support through tangible, visible presence and service. They did things for people and thus secured their loyalty. The norm of lots of branch offices and weekly meet the people sessions that characterize Singapore now 
originated with the labor front in the 1950s, but these quickly became centerpieces of PAP strategy and then of all parties. So parties provided and still provide essential grassroots services, such as kindergartens and assistance, often superfluous with the gamut of concerns. The People's Association has been central since the 1960s and much expanded since then. It functions in practice as PAP machinery, working through an alphabet soup of structures. There is on the PAP side, explicit, non-subtle modeling and encouragement that voters should see municipal services as what they value. Doing so delegitimates ideologies and competing platforms as a premise for voting or as offering new standards for accountability. In consequence, the share of opposition seats in parliament remains lower than in Malaysia. Civil society poses less of a political challenge or partisan resource and opposition parties offer less of an ideological challenge. So all told, focusing too much on who's in power at the top risks missing how the system truly functions at the roots, given how voters, politicians, and parties develop in the context of and respond to the incentives and constraints of long-term structures and norms. And I will stop there and turn to Wally. Okay, thank you so much, Meredith. That was really fascinating. And it's really a fascinating book. I urge everyone to get it. I've assigned it for my Politics of Singapore module. Uh, and I had to read it reread it this week and it's a very very easy read uh sophisticated yet a simple read so so thank you so much for that uh and i i wanted to pick up on some some of the points and maybe we can have a conversation here uh so perhaps uh something that people elsewhere do not appreciate this this norm of expecting uh the mp to be a neighborhood uh provider right of sorts and yeah. it's not just about service provide uh, provision right so uh, by the way this is also uh, it has something to do with the plurality system as well right the linkages between right. between the mp and the constituent so perhaps in a proportional representation system you wouldn't see right. this uh, as much but there is something even more specific right so i, I can just give an example so when my uncle passed or something, somebody who named me, so somebody who was very close to me. So I just posted uh, on Facebook. So uh, he was living in an opposition ward. So I posted on Facebook, the prayer will be held at the mosque near his house. So right after we did our prayers, I turned around and lo and behold, there was the, the leader of the opposition in the mosque, uh, Pritam Singh. He was just waiting for us to finish the prayers. He came over and he, he gave me a hug. Uh, and I, I'm not a resident there, but if I was a resident there, it'll be very difficult for me to vote against him. Yeah. Just based on that. I mean, that's not exactly rational. Uh, but yeah. and basically, the opposition does it even more than the PAP. The, the PAP yeah. set the term of the game. So you, you are absolutely spot on. I love the term acculturation, right? Uh, the, the term that you, uh, you, uh, you use throughout the book. And the opposition, in fact, sees itself as needing to do more of this. So they are taking the PAP on its mm -hmm. own terms, right? Uh, and that, that is something that I would like to return to. So I just wanted to start with the anecdote. So I have three, uh, three major uh, uh, questions for you, perhaps, then maybe we can open it to the floor. So the first is the conflation of the state and the party, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is uh, because the country has never, the two countries and Malaysia up until 2018 had never witnessed a change in government. So the government becomes a party, becomes a state, right? And there are really deep implications for it. Even right. you think about, about the security apparatus, right? Uh, right? It's tied to the state and it's tied to the party as well. And national security is party security. National interest is party interest. Sometimes we do not know where the party ends and where the state begins, or for, for instance, right? And so you've already talked about the benefits of that because when the state disburses funds, it's also seen as the party disbursing funds, right? But what about the disadvantages? What if right. uh, the civil service screws up? Uh, mm -hmm. And it may not be the fault of the party, but the party would get the blame as well, right? So would you do you think that the ultimately the, the situation evens itself out? Or do you think uh, it's still disproportionately, the fact that the party is the state, disproportionately weighs in the favor of the two ruling parties? I think, um, I actually think that on balance, this is a negative um, for a couple of reasons. It's, it's, it denies voters 
the opportunity to choose based on other criteria without worrying, often without real grounding, that they'll lose what they have. So um, I think I mentioned in the book, my favorite um, opposition, uh, political rally speech I heard in Singapore ever was from, I was at a PAP rally, I think in Clemente or somewhere around there, um, of um, if some PA grassroots leader who made this impassioned plea not to go back to the days of night soil carriers by voting the opposition. In other words, these were like, if, if the opposition comes in, sewage may go away, like the whole system, we will no longer have indoor plumbing in Singapore. And I mean, it's insane, right? But, but there's a really, a, again, a lot of this is a mirage of conflation of levels of government. We realize when another party comes into power that there are actually structural distinctions. So we see that in Singapore with town councils, for instance, that you know, if the PAP closes its town council office and makes the, the WP or another party open a new one, or if all the parties, if all the, the maintenance contracts have been privatized to make it harder for the opposition to come in and service providers won't provide, we realize, oh, this is actually something the party has been doing instead of the state, even though this is a parastatal HDB, the Housing and Development Board. So we realize at those moments of transition where the party and state are actually functionally separate but in ways that then cause problems. So on the one hand, it, it increases just inefficiencies, duplication of right. functions um, and, and those sorts of things. It also makes citizens in many ways hostage to those sorts of tensions that you, know, the, you do legitimately risk. You shouldn't have to risk being you know, last in line for upgrading an right. HDB, for instance, in Singapore, but you do legitimately risk not having a reliable service provider for maintenance contracts and so forth in HDB because of this really unnecessary system. Um, and Malaysia in particular, when the when Pakatan came into power in 2018, there was a lot of rumor of um, rumors of a deep state in the civil service, which was obstructing Pakatan. Right. My discussion with both Pakatan and um, the new opposition, you know, BN legislators, suggested that some of those rumors were overstated and you know sort of apocryphal. But at the same time, um, I refer to especially the work of Peter Kunawashida. It's a great book on. The you know, Malaysian political economy and civil service and so forth, the ways in which it's not just voters who become acclimated to this mode of government, but also a civil service that especially Absolutely. in Malaysia had never developed under a party other than UMNO. Absolutely. So they had by that point internalized this sense right. of, you know, UMNO's priorities were its own. And so it's not so much a question or it may, I mean, there may have been some who were trying to sabotage, who knows, but that's not even necessary. It's rather there so much of what happens in Malaysian government in particular is really administration. The top level of civil service does a lot of the work of actually governing. And if their priorities have never been separate from those of the BN, it's hard then to see like, what is the new national interest or what is the goal here? Or what does it mean to be a nonpartisan civil service when you've only ever worked under one party? And so in that sense, I do see this as having real problems that some of which are manufactured, like some of the issues of HDB management. And that's just that just looms so large in Singapore. And others are really just this endemic process akin to authoritarian acculturation of having had one level of one governing apparatus over such a long period. Yeah, uh, thank you. That was brilliant. And uh, I just wanted to share another anecdote. So I was at a forum once uh, with the prime minister. I believe this was in 2011, just before the elections. So uh, an undergrad just went to the, so I was an uh, undergrad, or I was doing my master. So uh, an undergrad went to the mic and said, I live in Haugang. So Haugang is uh, an opposition uh, ward. Mm -hmm. It's under the opposition. So he said, since I do not get leave priority for leave upgrading, can I serve fewer years or fewer months for national service? Uh, so he said, since it's a transactional relationship yeah. right, on your part, yeah. right, why can't it be a transactional relationship on, on our part? So there are there are real consequences. Yeah. Not, and and there are the, the, the thing about this, right? Uh, the ambiguities always benefit the ruling parties in, yeah. in this. Because it's true, a lot of it is overstated, but some of it is not. And we do not really know exactly where where uh, it is real and where it's yeah. not. And, and, and therefore, when you think the boundaries, when the boundaries are actually here, but you do not, don't know they are here, you operate right. here. Right? So there's a lot of space that you're allowed to operate, but you do not, right? right. Uh, so I guess uh, that, that goes to your point, Marathi. So my, yeah. my second point is, your story is a very instrumentalist story, right? Uh, so wh what is the role of ideology in this, right? So 
could you say that the 2018 election, for instance, that was a rejection of uh, BN's ideology on some level, at least not completely, but on some level. So it was in spite of the instrumental or the material benefit that voters could stand to benefit from BN being in power, there was still a rejection of that. So, and and maybe in, in Singapore, the, the story is the opposite, right? The WP is the PAP light, is the PAP in blue. But the other opposition party, which is further away from the PAP ideologically, Singapore Democratic Party, is not as successful. Is that because the PAP's ideologies have, PAP's hegemony has been internalized by Singaporeans? So, uh, no doubt, the material story is absolutely spot on, but I wanted to know what is the role of ideology in this story, if, if there is a role for, for it. Yeah, th this is a really intriguing angle, I think, so I'm glad you bring this up. Um, I tried to get a sense of what, what current like BN activists, not, not just politicians, but you know, those in um, you know, the youth wings, for instance, what they see as their party's ideologies. And I, I asked a group at um, the UMNO kind of youth leadership training center. This is uh, the Academy Captain Hussein. Uh, you know, just straight, point blank at one point, you know, what do you see as your ideology? And they looked at me blankly and said survival. And I think that actually pretty much sums it up. Oh, wow. I don't see today's BN or UMNO specifically as having an ideology. I mean, I think we see right. this now in the absolutely opportunistic coalitions built just on how can we get to the right number of seats with parties that have a really different premise. The most ideological parties in Malaysia are a party socialist Malaysia, which is genuinely ideological. It's committed to that ideology. It won't form alliances that are against that ideology. And because of that, it had one seat in parliament ever and does not seem likely to progress much beyond that. Um, sorry to any PSM supporters out there. Um, and then PAS, yeah. <laughs> but PAS has been fairly opportunistic in its oh, alliances, sure. um, especially over the last few years. So I think that even there, we're seeing um, a diminution of the role of ideology, even for, again, this, this party that's fundamentally premised and that it, its supporters, I think, really cleave to that ideological premise. I don't think, I think its leaders have made enough of a case that to put that ideology in practice requires joining the government, how it's how its performance under Perikata Nacional, not to get too much in the weeds, will diminish that, that argument um, among its supporters remains to be seen. But so I, I do think that ideology mattered for some voters in 2018, um, for, for what tipped the balance with, the, with those in Malaysia for whom it wasn't ideology, it was Najib. And right. I think that's, that's really core to why uh, Pakatan came in without a convincing mandate for reform. But for those for whom it mattered, there were some who voted for the sort of secular progressive agenda. And those were sort of the core voters of the DAP and Ka'adilan and, and Amana, you know, sort of the, the crux of the, the old Pakatan, um, but less for those who came in, I think from Amno Splinter Party Bursatu, which had never really, they, they just, it was Amno without, without Najib, which was Mahathir's, you know, overt premise in starting the party. Um, right. Or voters who turned to PAS. You know, and, and that was a third of Malay voters. So that was a really significant, you know, ideological vote that also may have included an anti-Najib component. That said, one can't separate an Islamist ideology as a political position from an anti-corruption or clean politics ideology. Just the ways in which the programmatic definition of political Islam has been set in Malaysia, as with, for instance, PKS in Indonesia, it includes this idea of political, a politically clean party. For Singapore, it's harder to say. I don't see the PAP as having a coherent ideology at this point. I'm not sure if PAP leaders actually would agree with that, but it's it's not. It's much more performance based. It's not. It's mm. vote for us because we we award you both at the, the individual level. Get those. Indiv I'm, I'm sorry about your uncle, um, Stanley, but um, but you. it's those those connections. I mean, the, the WP in particular has specifically prioritized building on the example of well, um, really attending funerals and providing rates and things like that. I mean, because you're right, it creates a really strong moral bond and sense of that somebody cares. So there's that, which undercuts an ideological premise, but there's also just the, the developmental state ethos and legacy for Singapore that the PP claims a developmental or performance legitimacy that they deserve to govern because they are the best performers in a managerial or economic sense. And that's not really, it's not in line with their initial sort of left-wing ideology. It, I think they've actually undercut them. So For in sure. trying to, like this 
endless recitation of we are not a welfare state. Even the poorest people will still pay our $30 a month in rent from state assistance for their HDB, you know, one room flat. I mean, that's really to say we are not a party of the left. We are not going to have dependency or be the be a, a security blanket or safety net, or not security blanket. Um, okay. Even as even though that's what they're doing, so they've downplayed rhetorically and through certain policy tweaks that ideological premise, even if they could choose to reclaim it. But then you don't really see. Certainly, WP doesn't really compete on ideology. They compete Definitely. on on a mechanic of. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think that there was a there was a possible shift back to this. If you think of the you know half step, James, yeah. you know, the, the half step to the left argument. Yeah. Um, but that's still, it's much more about the, but we need a voice in parliament. And actually SDP has picked up more on that as well. It's So yeah. that's more of a procedural argument than an ideological one. And so that voice in parliament could be for any specific goal. That facilitates opposition coalition building, which still hasn't really happened. Um, but because it just says we just need more opposition voices, whoever they may be to critique and check, not we need a move to the left as the opposition shifts. So I, I don't, See, I, I'm not sure I'd see this as PAP ideological hegemony so much as really trying to take ideology out of the equation to make these political decisions, these deeply political decisions seem to be administrative ones. These questions of who gets what and how to be just a question of what's what's the, the, the best way to do this. And that would right. be the, what the PAP decides is the best way. Right, okay, thank you. So that's a final one from me uh, and then we can open it to the floor. So I think one of, uh, I, one theme that really uh, goes throughout your book is uh, runs throughout your book is the idea that voters are not pawns, and you you mentioned that that particular phrase as well. And uh, elections are not meaningless, right? They are not fair, not completely mm -hmm. fair, but they are still meaningful, right? Uh, and that that is really, I think. Uh, a, a, an important contribution in it in itself because a lot of times we we tend to think of elections in Singapore as oh it's going through the motions right where even if the PAP gets ninety percent of the seats right but the vote share does scare the PAP yeah. right yeah the vote share even yeah. if they get sixty percent ninety percent of the seats but sixty percent of the votes that's forty percent that is against them in spite of all the institutional mm -hmm. advantages they do react to that so elections are not meaningless and voters do have a choice right which brings me to my next point right where does GE twenty twenty uh fit into your uh, your analysis because it seems like in spite of this in spite of the material benefits uh, the voters did show that there are some lines that shouldn't be crossed for instance yeah. so so one uh, one theory which i do subscribe to as well is that there was and the pap has admitted as well that they overreacted or they overplayed their hand right. uh well, when it came to raisa Han, who was a yeah. who is now a former member of parliament uh who i mean for 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 a different set of issues uh, that she she got herself into trouble for but at that point in time there were some tweets from the past uh, that uh, were alleged to have been racially insensitive. And the PAP really, really doubled down on that. And uh, they went on the attack against Raisa. But it seemed that that turned off a lot of voters, especially younger voters and minority voters, perhaps. So where does that fit in your story? Yeah, another really good question. Um, so in some ways, this is sort of easier to see in Malaysia just because of the, the state level and all of that. But yeah, for Singapore, for G2020, I, I, I think in many ways, yeah, the vote, so the, the simple, the the rules for majoritarian voting and the ways in which GLCs have been structured and all that in Singapore, those are obviously a core part of you know, electoral authoritarian resilience. It's just really functionally very difficult to vote a party out of power, especially, and then you know, depending on which opposition stands in a given community or constituency, there may not be an opposition block that functions mm -hmm. in a real way. So that, that's just, a, that's its own sort of mechanical issue. But you're right, the vote share itself does matter. And, and the PAP has claimed its legitimacy based on performance, but measures whether the voters see them as legitimate, I think, largely through, can they capture all the votes? And so right. I think they may have been overconfident after the 2015 election, which I right. think was to so much larger an extent a referendum on the role and legacy of Lee Kuan Yew than the PAP's actual performance. But we have a number yeah. of things working against the PAP this time that signal the extent to which voters do use elections to voice discontent. So there was you know, COVID and, and management of that. Um, and one small matter of that aspect of that was the way in which the campaign itself changed 
because of the lack of in-person, the rallies, which opposition parties tend to rely on much more than, than uh, governing parties, than the PAP. But the, the role of political debate, I mean, those televised debates, I think were really important for allowing right. an interaction. Rallies are one-sided echo chambers. And it may yeah. be that people do go and listen to them who are not going to vote, who are just curious, or they may yeah. watch them on YouTube, but there's no interaction. It's a one-sided story. And so seeing the, I think, seeing the, the way in which you have PAP leaders interact with WP or STP leaders may have helped to augment the sense of elitism or the problems with meritocracy or just the lack of an ethos of care, which the whole personal touch, meet the people session, et cetera, model is supposed to demonstrate in ways that were important. You also have um, really stark economic inequality um, in Singapore and rising. And that, especially with COVID, the pandemic shutdowns and all of that, sorry, circuit breaker, um, that I think also <laughs> really, um, you know, can make people less secure with the PAP's model. Um, there's the whole Lee family saga, which suggests that this family may not be so completely clean as uh, people have thought and just suggests it raises doubts about the 4G succession, uh, that the, the next generation of leadership that had already been, you know, somewhat uncertain. And we saw that with you know, both at the time of the election and soon after. So we have, in other words, in as much as voters are being asked to vote based on performance, um, that itself is not quite so rock solid as it had been. I do think mm -hmm. also these questions of ethnicity and communal voting and just understanding of the PAP's, not so much communal voting, but the understanding of the PAP's communal policies shifted, especially with this election. Some of that social media, some of it maybe, you know, just the rise of discourses of things like Black Lives Matter and just awareness of the ways in which we have encoded racial hierarchies, the discussion of Chinese privilege in Singapore. However much the PAP and some ideologues within society tried to, you know, sort of knock that away as, oh no, this is nonsense. How could it be? We have poor Chinese. That's not the point. That's not what privilege <laughs> says. But so those debates, you know, which, which continued after the election, I think signal, rather than leading the election, I think they signal a rise in critical awareness among younger Singaporeans in particular of the ways in which, you know, meritocracy and PAP models and so forth may re-encode or, or augment and reify racial hierarchies in ways that the PAP has never acknowledged. And so I do think that then they're pushing back actually hurt them because it made that right. seem more evident and made clear that no, actually, those who are not Chinese in Singapore may actually have grounds to complain. Um, one thing I, I haven't done research on this myself. I don't know people who have, but I'm sure there's someone. It's, you know, we do have an increasing share of interracial couples, of children who are, do not identify with one or another of Singapore's official CMIO categories um, who don't, or who don't want to be an O, you know, an other. Um, right, right. And so that itself may also help to change change some of the discussion. But I, I see all of those things as as creating um, new hurdles for the PAP that may actually need to assert, you know, this is what we believe in ideologically, not just meritocracy is, a, is an empty, it's, it's a category of approach, you know, this is, we, we, we work through meritocracy, but what makes, makes clear that someone has merit? I think that right. that's where the ideology would fit in and that's yeah. the black box right now. Um, the other, just so one sort of side piece of this I'll mention is the PAP has argued all along, especially in, you know, developing GLCs that, um, that GRCs, sorry, <laughs> um, that um, that Singaporeans vote based on racial lines, that um, minority candidates won't be elected if they're running in single member constituencies. That is empirically false. If we look at, you know, voting patterns up until the introduction of, of GLCs, in part because if the PAP ran an uh, ethnic minority candidate, that candidate would be likely to win. Yeah. The PAP usually wins. Um, but also, um, there's that, that, you know, some of the concerns at the time articulated by groups like Mara were um, that this could reify the idea of ethnic identity as being really core to, um, core to how people identify as Singaporeans. And so even as there's definitely an argument to be made for ensuring representation of um, ethnicities or as Natina Tan's work has argued increasingly also women within the GLC structure and selection, there are also problems with that model. And in practice, what tends to happen is, you know, if you listen to campaign speeches, um, I, I can't, I, I don't speak any Chinese languages, my apologies if I've missed big issues from that, I'm sure I have. But listening, for instance, to Malay language speeches, 
that it's not as though it's a direct translation of what the candidate says in English, you know, so there is an appeal mm. along ethnic lines and Malay PAP can't, the politicians I spoke with, you know, past or present did say that, or, or ethnic minority candidates generally that, you know, what they understood and were told was their mandate was partly looking after that community and making sure that there's a point of contact. So I don't see that as, as a bad thing to have, you know, representation, but I do think that it means the PAP's argument of being non-ethnic is, is less, less supportable given the way it has structured other rules. So in other words, we may have a contradiction, an internal contradiction in the ways that it's tried to stack the field um, that, that that now as more Singaporeans like Raisa Khan feel more comfortable expressing um, or just the availability of social media have a platform to express these tensions that it's just, it's hard to ignore and it's hard not to notice if you're Singaporean, the ways in which this is a communalized system even as it's ideologically not supposed to be. Right. Thank you so much. By the way, uh, for members of the audience, Meredith wasn't being hyperbolic. Uh, the, the argument made by some members of the establishment as to why Chinese privilege doesn't exist is because they are poor Chinese. Uh, yeah. And I think one of the biggest challenges, uh, I'll just end on this uh, note and hand it over uh, back to Ma Margaret, is the uncertainty about the 4G and I think the lack of credibility. In some ways, uh, GE 2020 was a referendum on the 4G leadership, especially their handling of COVID. And when the credibility or perceived legitimacy of the leadership uh, decreases, uh, do those types of tactics still work? Do the instrumentalists or even the draconian measures, do they still work? I mean, and that's something that I think uh, we will find out over the, the next few years. So over to you, Margaret. Wonderful. I, I could listen to you all for the whole time, but we do have some questions I'm, I'm thrilled to, to say. They have appeared in the Q&A, but I want to remind everyone that you can raise your hand. Uh, just hit the raise hand and then we'll, we'll actually let you ask your questions yourself. But I'll start uh, in the order they came in. And this is from an anonymous attendee. It's directed at Meredith, but, but I actually would love to hear both of you talk about this question. Uh, the question is, may I ask how, despite its dependence on a clientelist party machine, how the, P, the PAP avoided the problem of corruption and warlordism, that's a tough word, um, that plagues <laughs> Malaysia. Um, so did you guys both get that? I'd love to hear yeah. both of you. And then I might uh, package a few more in a minute. But please, okay. we have we have another more than half an hour, so put your questions in, everyone. Thanks. Great, um, and I'm happy to see some familiar names, and um, even if I can't see familiar faces in the chat or in the participants list. Um, so um, th this is something that I really tried to look at in examining um, the political economy in both states. On the one hand, there there are of course you know some concerns that maybe there 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 have been some shady deals and such in Singapore. If there are, and and uh, you know undoubtedly there have been some. You know these are humans. Um, I, I that it really has not been a feature of the state led share of the economy to anywhere near the extent uh, as it has been in Malaysia. I think the overarching most important factor is that the. The, the, the state, the, the, that part of the political economy in Malaysia is controlled by parties much more than by parastatals or fairly insulated development agencies. So if we look at this in terms of um, the literature on developmental states, so the model of a developmental state, Singapore has put that into practice to a much greater extent than Malaysia has. So there are elements of that in Malaysia, of this insulated, protected, non-politicized, um, economic um, machinery. Um, and so I think that those parts have tended to help Malaysia and have helped to ensure economic advance. But at the same time, we have, you know, these party-linked holding companies, which control a fairly si significant amount of the economy. We have the politicization of GLC boards, government-linked corporations and government-linked investment um, companies. So Terence uh, Gomez's work certainly delves into that in great detail. We see that increasingly, as Terence has written, not just on the BN side, but also at the state level on the Pakatan Party side. So this again becomes an enduring way. Parties need resources. They also need, you know, shareholder positions or, or corporate board positions for their members. And so there were some marginal changes under Pakatan, but not not 
tremendous. Um, and so I think just the extent to which we have partisan capture in Malaysia has led to increasing the sort of political rent seeking. And that warlordism is both because of the spoils of party office of being able to capture those benefits for reelection and then also to have these different corporate board positions and so forth, but also both shapes and reflects the warlordism within parties. So these deep factions that form because something is at stake. It's not just bringing the party to power, it's bringing the, the individual faction to power. And some of that reflects the mass rather than cadre system within Malaysia, within Malaysian parties um, that you build if you have a mass party in which you rise to power from the very local level, the branch level on up through um, and you need votes, which for instance, Adilan replicated this when it formed, you need votes from your local branch level. You as an aspiring politician have an incentive to sign everybody up for the party and get them to vote for you. You might do that through rewards. And so it means that you have this inter-party politicking. So money politics in Malaysia, actual vote buying is stronger for party elections, at least for UMNO, than for national elections, just you know, on a nationwide level. You have pockets of vote buying in Malaysia, but it's less of an issue. Um, whereas for the PAP, that's not the case. You don't, you don't get nominated to stand, and it's in the passive. You get nominated, you don't stand, you get nominated um, by working your way up through the party or by building a personal base. Once you're running, you try to solidify a personal vote just to help tip the balance. So you will, and, and this is again how, as uh, well, it's example of, you know, for the, his, the, the prayers for his uncle of, you know, opposition politicians is seeing this as a way that they too can build up. It's not just through economics, but it is this, this way of building support. But that's really separate in Singapore from the state-led investment companies and so forth. The same time the PAP claims credit for the proper management, that they haven't siphoned up, off more of those funds for meeting, for instance, the needs of an increasingly economically unequal society, that they've maintained that base for the long-term goals. So even things like the institution of the elected presidency in the 1980s was to make sure that in the case of a free collection result in which people accidentally voted in the opposition, the opposition couldn't do too much damage. Um, and so that's it's, it's that sort of both real and um, rhetorical safeguards that, that do signal, I think, in Singapore, a genuine commitment to making sure that yes, the PAP will will use resources in partisan ways, but not to the extent of you know, really capsizing economic development. I don't think Malaysia has those guardrails. They may initially have tried. And I do think that there are elements within the economy. There are certain agencies and institutions that do function well. But at the same time, there's a lot more slippage in Malaysia than in Singapore. Walid, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, so I think uh, Meredith touched on almost everything that I wanted to say as well. So the, the cadre party structure, for sure, I think that uh, minimizes dissent from uh, within the uh, uh, the PAP. So if the PAP is going to split, it's not going to be based on ideological grounds because all of them are basically practically carbon copies of each other. Unlike AMNO, right, where uh, you, because of the mass party structure, you can see people with differing ideologies. Uh, so, so, and that's both a weakness and a strength of, of the party uh, party structure. But there, there are also other clearer incentives. So the developmental state uh, thing that uh, Meredith talked about. So the bureaucracy is is very well paid in Singapore, much more so than in much more so than the Malaysia, Malaysian bureaucrats are the right. are the ministers are the best paid, the highest paid in the world, the ministers. Yeah. So uh, and that definitely drastically reduces the incentive for, for that. So that, those are in terms of formal institutions. I would say even informal, uh, and then there are harsh, really severe uh, punishments for people who are, who are caught with uh, doing, doing corrupt things within the civil right. service, including a former housing minister who was, who, uh, who was investigated. Eventually, he right. committed suicide, a PAP minister. So uh, this was in the 70s. Uh, and I, I myself, when I was serving national service, I was, I was in the police. So I was walking with my partner and suddenly this guy, he just went up the curb. So he was driving. He just went up the curb and he hit a lamppost. So, and when he came down, so I, I went to him and he reeked of alcohol. So clearly he was drink, uh, drink driving. And uh, the first thing he said to me was, uh, hey, bro, uh, don't arrest me. I'll give you $2,000. He just said that to me. And I immediately like, there, there was no chance that I was going to accept. Maybe because it was $2,000. So I wasn't tempted <laughs> enough. <laughs> but I did, I rejected it instinctively 
not because I was afraid of God, because I believe God can forgive me, but the PAP won't be so okay. <laughs> so uh, I was, there is that culture, there is that culture within the civil service as well. So the informal part as well, which is of course a result of decades of formal institutions being, being uh, realized. But the, the informal culture is there as well. And I do not see this in the Malaysian civil service compared to the Singapore civil service. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's worth just to build on that just a tiny bit. It's worth mentioning that one of, um, you know, a, a re recurrent and, and certainly a Pakatan proposal for reforming the police, for instance, where you could get away with a lot less than 2000 saying, I think, for um, most, <laughs> um, most issues, but um, is that the pay is miserable. You know, the, the career prospects are poor, the pay is really low. So it's not, you know, just, just paying a fair amount makes police officers less reliant on the sort of do it healthy, yeah. the, you know, the extra payment. Yeah. Um, and so that that's, you know, just sort of the fundamentally setting up a state that can work as planned. Um, for Malaysia, a major hindrance to that is the incredibly bloated size, you know, one of the world's largest, if not the largest per capita yeah. civil services. It's just not possible to, to pay yeah. more, most likely. Um, I'm going to move on to Lisa Lee's question. It's somewhat related, actually. Uh, and she asks the, to, for you both, I think, to talk about uh, talk about establishing an ombudsman through the PAP. Uh, sorry, in Singapore, but the PAP, of course, is opposed to this. Uh, right. And she's wondering whether a truly independent body in Singapore would even be possible, given the many links, familia, friendship, work, etc., that the elites in Singapore have with each other, including with the PAP. Uh, so alms would be beyond just corruption, yeah. uh, but certainly corruption would be one one aspect of what they would look at if it was to be. I mean, part of this would be an issue for any small country, right? Where yeah, the elites all know each other, and increasingly, what defines you know WP leadership as an acceptable opposition is that they're indistinguishable from PAP leadership exactly. and sometimes the same people that have just shifted parties that, you know, who are sort of moving. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that that rules out the possibility of an ombudsperson. It would depend a lot on finding the right person. So what would be really challenging is if somebody assumes that role who turns out not to be so nonpartisan and neutral, but that's where actually those tight elite networks might help. I think people have a sense of who, who can be trusted, at least at any given point, as a neutral ombudsperson. There could be a, you know, some sort of multi-partisan board set up or something. So it would require careful design in a way that I don't see the PAP as ever supporting, just because it would mean recognizing that the risk is of partisan control, not that the risk is that, you know, why do we need this at all? Um, so that that's really the challenge. I don't see it as an issue of can one have a neutral party when we have a tightly knit elite, but rather why would the PAP ever agree to that? So, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And I I am in favor of that. And I'm, I'm, I use maybe as a proxy also, or as an analogy, the, the Electoral Commission, for instance, is not, it's under the Prime Minister's office, right? So I am in favor of making it independent yeah. and, and ombuds, uh, ombudsman, ombudsperson as well. However, I am also under no illusion that this is not a panacea uh, because uh, it, they could set up an independent ele electoral commission and get friendly independence <laughs> on board, right? Uh, and we all know, Meredith and I know who, for instance, among the academic community are more friendly to the establishment versus others. And they are independent. They are independent uh, on paper and they could easily go and probably do the, the exact same thing as uh, the people who are on the electoral commission now would be doing, and then there would be no cause for for criticism or a, a lesser cause for criticism, right? Because it's already independent. What else do you guys want, right? So, I am in favor of it, but I'm saying that I think the questioner is right. Uh, all these links do make it slightly more difficult, even if we get there. First of all, the the PP doesn't want it. Just last week, it was this was discussed in parliament. Uh, the uh, the ombudsman uh, and an opposition MP uh, brought it up. I think uh, Professor Chiran George and Donald Lowe also uh, talked about it in their book. Uh, and the Minister Shan Morgan basically shot the idea down. So the PAP wouldn't do it. And even if they did it, I do not think it will be a panacea. Other things still need to be rectified as well. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to uh, Jaja Joe's question. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. I was wondering to what extent authoritarian acculturation is linked to the authoritarian regime per se. Do you think this would apply to democratic dominant parties, uh, for instance, in Japan? So this is another really good question. Um, Japan ended up being uh, something of a key foil or backdrop for what I was looking at in Malaysia and Singapore, in part because the Kohenkai system, and I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that, um, in Japan is so closely parallel to the level, to the sort of individualized support structures that we see politicians develop in Malaysia in particular, but also on a, on a less disconnected from the party basis in Singapore. So those those structures do acculturate citizens toward a model of clientless politics. So those are these sort of very personalized systems of support under the LDP tied to individual politicians who fund them and who use them to build a personal vote. They have everything from, you know, different clubs and activities to, you know, support networks and so forth. And that makes it harder for the LDP to be a coherent, organized party and to assert central control. But if they were to eliminate those, then they'd also lose a lot of their voting public. Um, at the same time, what's really helped the LDP to a large extent is not unlike in Singapore, lack of a coherent opposition that can really come up with a way to govern instead. So when there was a flip, um, it didn't really change much about the state and um, it flipped back. Um, and so in that sense, it's it, it, that helped to highlight the extent to which that personal support for the LDP mattered. The main changes that we saw were actually under an LDP prime minister who did away with some of the structures that allowed excessive patronage or um, support. And then the other big change for Japan, which I think has real importance for understanding Singapore and Malaysia is what has shifted there to weaken the role of these Kohenkai, these networks, or those sorts of uh, personal ties, which is really a, a, an aging population, urbanization, this the structural shifts within society and the political economy, such that we have less of an agricultural base, for instance, which relies on, on specific types of inputs. We have a more mobile population that won't necessarily um, be linked to an individual patron. We have, you know, just differences in how people, you know, ally with. Um, different parties. But that hasn't necessarily meant that other parties are strengthening dramatically, as I understand it. And I'm not an expert on Japan. It's more meant that the LDP can count on a less secure level of, of interest in the party or support. Um, and so in that sense, we do have acculturation, but this also helps to demonstrate the ways in which that acculturation is not the be all end all. In other words, it matters and they help to sustain a system and make it certainly more resilient than it would otherwise be but it's not, it's not the only factor at play. Um, and so in this, in my book, I'm talking about authoritarian acculturation, but we could make a larger argument, which I tried to hear, of really taking political culture more seriously and understanding politics on the ground, that it matters what people expect of their legislators, to what do they hold them accountable. We talk about voting in any system, ability, even when votes don't matter or when they won't change the government, they at least allow assertion of voice, but saying what? In other words, to what are, voters responding when they cast that vote. And so part of that is this, this question of to what are they cult acculturated? What do they expect? And so, yeah, I do think that we could have, we could talk about democratic acculturation or other sorts of this sort of long-term acclimation to a particular way of doing and experiencing politics. Great, thank you. Um, it made me think of a new book out on Filipino politics, which describes the importance of understanding democratic ambivalence. Yeah. That's also a political culture where people want a strong man, but also want a democracy. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think that the understanding culture underneath politics is something that political science maybe has not stressed yeah. enough. Thank you. Um, I'm going on to this next question, which is an interesting one, uh, but also simple. Why did you decide to compare Malaysia and Singapore? Uh, what's the rationale? Uh, and what, why do you think that comparison has led to interesting results? Insights. Yeah, um, yeah. So there. I mean, the the unofficial reason is that I study Singapore, Malaysia, and so that's what the countries I thought of. But really, the I I think it was more that, like many, I think I vacillate between seeing Malaysia and Singapore as so similar, and then also seeing them as so fundamentally different, and that itself suggested to me 
especially in light of the fact that these two states, you know, are the longest lasting electoral authoritarian systems globally. I mean, Mexico is a competitor there, but um, but they had transitioned to democracy much earlier. It just started earlier as a, as a independent state. Um, that these two states are the longest lasting in what political scientists see as a particular category. And so even though one may see them in terms of their differences or their similarities, they still fall within that same outcome. So in some ways it's sort of a most different systems approach perhaps, but so that really just got me thinking. Um, the other key factors were, um, there were so many, and this made it hard to figure out how to structure the study and the methods. So studying political culture is really difficult. Um, it's not easily measurable. I have grouses with all these types of survey questions we may use to grasp, you know, what do you think of democracy or whatever else. Um, and we have a shifting array of parties that align in different ways. So I tried as hard as I could to cover the full array of parties that have any significance and some that have very minimal significance, but were sort of interesting initiatives in both countries. Um, and that that was both to make sure I had balance in my research and also that I didn't miss any sort of intriguing, you know, closed off paths or whatever else. So I looked, oh, that was a lot of the more historical portion, for instance, of the research. But in terms of why these two, we do have, you know, a very similar, in many ways, colonial heritage. We have similar voting roles, which are a really important part of what structures a system, majoritarian rather than proportional representation. Um, the addition of group representation constituencies, GRCs in Singapore does change that. Um, and the availability of a state level vote in Malaysia also changes that. But a couple of the things that, um, that came to loom really large in the project as I went on, which I had never expected to be perfectly honest. This is a very inductive project. Um, really also highlighted where these structural similarities were important in ways I hadn't expected. And those were the salience of local governance and lo specifically the eradication of elected local governments and the substitution of what I found. I just never really thought about it that much in either state, frankly, um, of what were really party controlled um, stopgap measures, that that came to seem really quite salient. And then the role of, of extra party networks. And so, as well as the, the personal touch, which I'd realized in coordinating this research project on, on the 13th general election in Malaysia in 2013, that the one constant across all constituencies, we had researchers nationwide in every state, was the personal touch. Regardless of what else was happening, that was dominant. And that was, that was intriguing across parties and across regions. So I started, I realized, huh, you know, meet the people sessions in Singapore are really much the same and sort of went from there. But the other thing was, I was, I, I study civil society a lot. Like that's one of my main areas of focus. And I don't think I, even though I had a, a book on the ways in which civil society helped to build opposition coalitions and opposition politicians, possibilities in Malaysia, I think I had swallowed the Kool-Aid that in Singapore, there are no such links between the party and what's outside the party. I knew the role of, of um, trade unions, for instance, but hadn't really thought through that. So a lot of this is just my own ignorance gave rise to this particular comparison. But, um, but also just once I started to look more closely, how much the People's Association matters to what the PAP has done. I mean, it's really looking at some of the historical documents since the establishment, it is a remarkable, um, it's remarkable for what it does, but it's also a remarkable feat of political engineering that allows the PAP to have essentially a, a, a huge support network outside the party, um, which gives it this advantage, which then offers a really intriguing parallel with the somewhat more organic uh, linkages between parties and civil society organizations in Malaysia. So in other words, I started off just looking for what I might find. And as I developed that analysis, this may not be the best way to go about planning academic research for those working on prospectuses, but you know, reality. Um, but um, as I started working through it, I started just finding these really intriguing points of comparison of where you have what seem ostensibly similar, but actually represent underlying differences or the role of, this was something that actually Chua Ben Huat suggested to me when I discussed the project with him fairly early on. So who chooses, who are the gatekeepers? Who chooses who gets to stand? And that led me off on another tangent that ended up being really central to the explanation of how party structure matters, mass parties versus cadre structures. Um, and so I, I ended up with a greater sense of the divergence between these two systems that actually gave me much more to work with, even as they then converge on the same sort of resilience. And so that's the, the honest, if not very you know scholarly sounding political science -y 
way in which I came to settle on these two states. Um, at the same time, various people pointed me towards other um, other countries that like Karis Temple's Templeman's work on Taiwan or um, the Cross and Buchanan book on, on Japan was essentially, um, you know, just really pivotal and, and making me realize how much that state and um, various other people's work on Japan as well posed a really useful comparison. Uh, the work of Ken Green and others on Mexico. So I had other cases that really perform, for me at least, a really essential analytical role in helping me to crystallize what the patterns were that I was examining and what was really central analytically. But yeah, otherwise the empirical research, which is the crux of the book, is very much on these two states. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, and this gets back to my initial, yes, however unsystematic it may sound, I work on these two countries, but to do this sort of research required, I don't think I could have written this book earlier in my career. I mean, I went back and looked at my notes from interviews I did 20 years ago and found kind of interesting you know, prompts, but the level of, of and I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of politicians out there who you know, have you know, no interest in what I'm doing, like most, certainly it's not all, but, but also have, you know, don't trust me in whatever ways, but the level of trust required among politicians, parties, um, civil society organizations, especially looking across parties. So it's not just linked to one party because that would probably screw up the research, but that I think takes time. So even if somebody hadn't read anything I'd, I'd written before, being able to say, I've been working in these two countries and I speak these languages and so on and so forth for this period of time, I think made it possible to do this sort of research. And this was one of the frustrations of the book was however much I loved doing this research and found it you know, really rewarding and at least to me, really interesting. I'm trying to propose a different way of looking at how regimes function and how we might study government guided by the incredible work of people like Michael Ong in Malaysia and Chang Heng Chi in Singapore who have much greater insight and access than I could ever dream of having. But I'm recommending this as a way, even as I recognize it's really difficult. Like this isn't, it, it took years. It's not something that can be done through statistics. It's not something that can be done through just looking at party records or anything like that. And so, and it's, I, I was just fortunate to have you know, good connections who helped me get in touch with people or helped to facilitate meetings or, you know, politicians who for whatever reason just were trusting and helpful. But that's that's something that makes it really hard to do this research that also then limits the cases on which I might have focused. Thanks, Meredith. That was very interesting to hear uh, and very um, a wonderful frame. Uh, I'm going to put together an anonymous question and one from Noji Yr. Uh, I just butchered your name, I'm sorry. The first is a speculative one of, about Malaysia. If it was to move towards more programmatic appeals, would voting patterns be more rigid than it is in a clientelist ecosystem? And then I wanna go, that's Malaysia. And then there's one on PAP that always says that it's the altar of efficiency on which all politics rest. And uh, if there, the question is, does this, uh, consideration that efficiency is all, has this undercut electoral popularity in recent elections? And I'd love, Wally, if you would also weigh in on, on the, those two things, one more programmatic in Malaysia or stop being so efficient in Singapore, would it change politics at all? Yeah, I definitely want to hear Wally's take on this too, so I'll be more brief than I have been. Um, so this is, it's an intriguing angle to consider. So on the one hand, a norm of efficiency or an ideology of efficiency, if we can call it that, would suggest a programmatic approach. But in fact, if we look at the PAP special packages that it's distributed, not just at election time, but, but certainly especially then um, over recent years in particular, those aren't necessarily more efficient. They're stopgap measures rather that, that, are, that specifically call out you know, the pioneer generation or the sandwich generation or, you know, just specific constituencies, those who are taking care of elders and youth, those who are, you know, the senior citizens, whatever else, civil servants with, with benefits, right? Or even if you look at, there's been a recent discussion over um, increasing the GST, the goods and services tax. And so to increase the tax, but then give people a payment there, you know, the assumption is, I assume, that you, you don't notice that you're paying that extra few percent GST over time, but you do remember the check you got that, or the you know, probably direct deposit of a payment, right? And so that's not necessarily more efficient, but it does accomplish the same policy goal in a way that maximizes credit claiming and, and a sort of attribution of benefit. So in that sense, those packages, I think actually help 
its electoral popularity. So it's the moving away from the most efficient streamlined approach, I think actually does help its popularity because it gives that, uh, that potential for a more personal vote or more of a sense of, all right, so I may not agree with some of the things done in the name of efficiency, but at least I've been protected. Um, and I'm stretching that a little bit, but that's the my general sense of it. Um, in terms of programmatic appeals in Malaysia, yeah, I do think that that could yield um, more rigid voting patterns because if parties are differentiating themselves on programmatic lines, on the one hand, that would really complicate coalition building. Um, and so that would probably require, just because of the ways that majoritarian voting rules work, pairing off some of the parties. In other words, some would likely wither away. We tend to have a default to a two-party norm or in Malaysia, a two-coalition norm where we have majoritarian voting rules just because of the difficulty of for third parties. In Malaysia, this is hard to see because of the Islamist alternative, which is you know, ideologically different from uh, either a sort of a communal non-Islamist model or a secular progressive model. And so I do think though that, that highlighting ideology and programs attached to that ideology does require a, or does encourage a level of voter loyalty because you're not then voting based on who has done something for you, who came to your wedding, who do you know, but rather what do they represent in terms of, of um, policy. And I'm actually, if with your um, permission, uh, Margaret, I thought I could actually touch on this other question here about civic education since we're running around time, which is yeah. to say that, yeah, NGOs can actually, so the question is what, do you, what are the possibilities of ground up civic education as from NGOs as a counter to authoritarian acculturation that actually can be really key. And so one of the things that was really intriguing for me was seeing the ways in which different, there's been this um, plethora of often youth-led um, NGOs in Malaysia that have been really trying, and, and some of this has been an alliance with First Seat, for instance, the electoral mo reform movement, to encourage voters to look at policy records, to encourage them to look at who sits on what GLC, to encourage them to look at what they've actually gained from this or that party and to compare platforms. So actually putting out, you know, whether it be media analyses or scrutinizing, these are the policy platforms that have a lot of similarities, but here are the differences. That that sort of civic education about what people could or should be looking for actually is really important. A number of Pakatan candidates or politicians or parties have engaged in that sort of work. I see less of it um, on the BN side, but at the same time, even they have set up these different think tanks to try to encourage civic engagement uh, in recent years, these school of politics, these political politics schools. So I do see, see that as a really fruitful avenue for trying to, to shake this notion of politician as patron and make, just change people's notion of what it is that they could expect from a politician. And that may yield a more programmatic approach with attendant party loyalty. Walid, could we hear your thoughts on that? And uh, yeah. you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I I agree as well. So uh, I would say for for the Malaysia question, maybe an uh, an example uh, would be uh, the BJP in India and how they have managed to. Uh, one of the reasons, even though the BJP started off as an upper class, uh, upper class, upper caste uh, party, mm -hmm. uh, and it has managed to get substantial support from lower class and lower caste Hindus, even before this, uh, this I would say more right wing turn, uh, even more of a right wing turn, is because of its uh, programmatic approach, uh, especially it, in, in terms of its targeted uh, welfare provision, right? Uh, and that could be a way out in terms of, you know, uh, I think Meredith talked about this in her in her talk as well. You know, PAS, yes, PAS is ideologically Islamist, but PAS is perhaps the most opportunistic party amongst all of all of the parties. It can go from uh, Islamic state to welfare state just in a jiffy, as long as it smells, it smells the opportunity to be, but of course it can go back to an Islamist Islamic state as well, if it smells an opportunity to, to be in power. So, so yeah, I think there is that possibility. Yeah. Uh, then for Singapore, I would say it is a bit of a myth to say that the PAP only worships efficiency. I think in some ways, uh, the PAP has some uh, prior ideological assumptions that are not interrogated enough. I'll just give a quick example. So uh, Meredith talked about this, the M empirical uh, data doesn't suggest that people do not vote for 
uh, for people from uh, their only from their own race. So Lee Kuan Yew was asked about this, and uh, he said uh, that the the person the, the journalist actually asked him, uh, saying that you know all the data we have shows that Singaporeans will help each other out uh, in times of crisis uh, without looking at that person's race. And Lee Kuan Yew just said, oh. In a survey, they are just saying what they want others to hear, right? Now, he is he's not 100% wrong, right? There is the concept of social desirability bias, right? But my point is, there is no empirical data that could have yeah. changed his mind on that, right? And that is an ideological position, right? And there are numerous such positions. I think that's the impression that uh, the PAP wants to give that it's only concerned about efficiency. In some in some cases, yes, but I would say it's it's quite ideological in many ways as well. Uh, but the idea is, I think it helps uh, their cause to think that, oh, we are above and beyond these ideologies, right? Uh, I think Kenneth Paul Tan talked about how uh, elitism is a, is a fundamental ideology of the PAP, right? Uh, uh, he talked about this uh, in his article as well. And I think there are a few others as well. Yeah. Great. We're starting, sadly, I had a, a, a couple of questions I wanted to ask, but we don't have time. Um, so we'll just have to call you back. I, I, I'd love to hear what you all think of across the region. There's a lot of talk that the next generation has better ideas and is bucking against the, the hold of authoritarianism in various places sadly not so successfully. Um, and I wonder whether you, either of you have any sense after hearing for, for decades, oh, the next election, things yeah. will change. Bercy is gonna change Malaysia. The young people are gonna get rid of the PAP. We've been hearing this for a very long time. Yeah. So I'd love to hear if you could in your uh, wrap up, I'll give you two minutes. Um, but for, before that, I forgot to mention that a very important partner of the network is the Weatherhead East Asia Institute, and it is a co-sponsor of today's event. So with that, I want to thank you both, and I'm going to turn it over to you both to wrap it up with whatever you want. Yeah. Thanks. So I'll, I'll go first so Meredith can have the last word. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I used to be a bit more skeptical of this idea that the younger people will be will be the one, and I'm thinking, which younger people are we talking about? Yeah. This, these people, this TikTok yeah. generation. Uh, <laughs> then the 2020 election gave me some hope gave me some hope that there was, I did see that there was uh, uh, an appetite to not uh, not take unfairness and injustice uh, and, uh, in Singapore. And I think we already saw this in Malaysia uh, earlier, but we only really saw it in Singapore in 2020. Now, of course, when push comes to shove, and the PAP has a lot of ways to... Uh, to dampen the spirit of our younger people in terms of their activism. Right? When push comes to shove, uh, we'll see what happens uh, because uh, now, now actually it's an interesting uh, period, right? Because the leader of the opposition and another member of the opposition, they are going to be charged in court essentially and they may lose their seats. And then we'll really, we'll really uh, see. I mean, of course, I don't want to, uh, I mean, it's not sub say or anything, but so we don't know how the, the court process yeah. will go. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to see how young people will react to that or how voters yeah. will react to that in the next election. Because I think one election by itself, it's not enough of a data point. But if you see it over two or three elections, then you can definitely say. So for, for me, yes, I think it can. Uh, I, I'm agnostic on that, but I'm, I'm a bit optimistic. But hope is a dangerous thing. Yeah, so I, I agree with Waleed, unsurprisingly, um, in terms of Singapore. And I do think it'll take more than one election, but then also more than one flashpoint. So I do think this is upcoming, um, this uh, yeah, ongoing case. Um, well, it'll be intriguing to see how different sets of citizens frame what this, what this investigation represents, whether they leap to say, oh, this is, you know, the PAP is pretty and special, or if they say, well, actually, there was something that went really wrong here. Um, and so that's, that's an open question at this point. But I do think, yeah, that we need to look at there's, there's fluctuation in the vote swing and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and it hasn't, the other thing is that, you know, in Singapore, we have compulsory voting. So we have a different way of an analyzing trends in voting, but we don't have exit polls in either country. So the yeah. sorts of claims that we can make about how different people vote 
yeah. are somewhat shaky. I mean, IPS yeah. in Singapore gets some good data. In <laughs> Malaysia, actually, the only claims we can safely make really are um, at, at the individual level without that ecological fallacy problem are about age-based voting in many places because of the Salaran, the, the ways in which um, voting, the lines for voting, the polling boxes are demarcated by age. But so there's always a level of speculation. And then, yeah, survey data, Lee Kuan Yew's not 100% wrong, but then when the surveys are useful, they rely on that. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so, all right, but yeah. From Malaysia, I'll say that it's actually, I can say with some confidence that it's a much more mixed picture. And I've got um, a paper with um, Ibrahim Sufian and uh, Ted Lee at Redeka Center now that looks at this, that really finds that um, ethnic voting is a communal voting or communal um, attitudes, political attitudes are actually much more solid than um, age-based sort of the cohort effects, both in voting and because it's only now, like this calendar year that um, those under between 18 and 21 are able to vote, that, that we expect this to persist through, um, through voting behavior. But this is especially true for the Malay majority. And I think the single most important reason for this is the ways in which over the decades of BN rule, the regime structured the political economy in ways that encourage or oblige communal voting. So when Pakata, what their Merdeka Center surveys actually show that, you know, the, the almost immediate, you know, within a matter of months, as each, as UMNO and its partners, including PAS, but also um, different NGOs, politicized and racialized each different issue from the International Criminal Court to civil service and so forth, the, the support among especially Malay and other Bumiputra youth, as well as other you know, Malays, really dipped rapidly for Pakatan. And so um, we did see a youth effect at the moment of the elections, which I do think you know, is something that could build over time. And we see it persist among uh, non-Malay voters, but non-Malay voters are so firmly against right. BN exactly. and now PN yeah. that it's really hard to make much of that. Yeah. But among Malay youth in particular or and other Bumi Putra, we find really strong support for Parikatan, which is not a democratic, not, you know, it's a fundamentally undemocratic agreement. Um, and so that really suggests that things like Mahathir's plans under Bursatu and, and Pakatan to diminish the size of the civil service, that's a ma massively important employer for Malay and other Bumiputra youth. And so that's really working against their self-interest or to diminish um, you know, those sorts of protections for not just Islam. I think that, that that's, a, that's a more um, ideological or opportunistic depending on the moment um, <laughs> case to make. Um, Can I just jump in? When, yeah. I just want to respect yeah. everybody's time. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. We can keep going, but I just want to say for those who do need to go on, we're over. Thank you okay. for joining us and please um, pay attention to what the network does and we welcome you back. And we want to get both Meredith and we, there were so many things we didn't talk about. It's clear, but carry on and finish your answer. I'll, but I'll just, just wrap up with, the with, with one statement, which is to say that in other words, the ways in which younger Malaysians, especially Malay and other Bumiputra, their personal self-interest, their career chances, everything else is so closely tied to the specific model that one political coalition has put in place and represents, that that really limits the space for safe um, vote switching or development of new programmatic priorities. And so that's where civic education can help and where the clear articulation of consistent other alternatives can also help by giving some, some confidence, where modeling at the state level can make a huge difference. And I think that was a big part of what happened in 2018. But what, the, what these parties modeled at the state level was essentially the same sort of clientelistic party machine-based service delivery and welfare support to say, no, look, we still got your back. Um, but the specific challenge to a communal order will make that sort of shift really difficult even among otherwise ideologically predisposed youth. And that's part of what I mean by this acculturation. It's saying, look, even if you recognize, I kind of prefer a party that has this different premise, your own interests are so tied through mm. these, these structural features or these personalized right. features that it's just hard to change. Mm -hmm. Great. With that, I wanna say what a great conversation. Thank you both very, very much. And thanks to everyone for coming.